Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. My name is Reverend Mark Chang. Uh, w- delighted to have you worshiping with us today. Today's sermon is going to be for everyone who has something that hates that they hate about themselves, which I think is going to be most of us. We'll start with Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of their mistress, so our eyes look to you, O Lord our God, until you have mercy on us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease of the contempt of the proud. Let's start with prayer. Let's pray. This sermon today is for everyone who has something that they hate about themselves. Maybe it's a thing about, uh, maybe you hate a thing about you so much that uh, you probably hate yourself too. You wish you could be different. You pray that God would change you. But that doesn't do a thing. The problem persists. It's a weight on your mind, a pain in your neck. It's a thorn in your flesh. Today we talk about St. Paul's thorn in his flesh. The way he saw his thorn reframed his suffering into a blessing. And I think Paul's words in 2 Corinthians can help you and I reframe the issues that we face. Let's get straight to the scripture. In Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, this is 2 Corinthians, uh, it's not actually his second letter. Scholars believe that 2 Corinthians is actually a collection of several letters from Paul to the church in Corinth. Chapters 10 to 13 are mostly fragments from one letter written at a time when Paul needed to defend himself from accusers. Things weren't going great in Corinth. Paul fears that there's jealousy and quarreling, anger, slander, disorder, etc. going on. And he is bracing himself for a fight. Reading between the lines, it seems that there are people in Corinth claiming that Paul isn't all that. Maybe they're saying that Paul was wrong, or Paul had no authority, or Paul's just a snake oil salesman. We've got no idea what was happening, but Paul feels the need to be defending himself. This brings up a lot of conflicting emotions in Paul. He's being put into a position where he has to compare himself to these rivals, like he has to show up with his resume. Repeatedly, he says that he doesn't want to boast about himself, and then he goes on to say something boastful. He's clearly frustrated with being put in this position. I love this second letter of Corinthians because it really does sound like a letter, It's not as well-crafted and articulated as, say, his letter to the church in Rome. Here, Paul is a little more rambling, and he repeats himself. But in doing so, you get a better sense of Paul's emotions. 
Here is a man who has spent significant time establishing the church in Corinth. He took donations from other churches to help fund uh, his ministry there. He put all of his sweat and tears into it. And now this same church is turning on him. He's feeling attacked. He's second-guessing all of the ministry that he did there. He's trying to figure out what he did wrong. Maybe he was too lenient on them or too hard. Was there more that he could have said or done? Corinth is a significant place to have a church. It's kind of like establishing a church in New York or Los Angeles. Uh, If it succeeded there, it could spread around the world. But if it fails, it could undermine everything. Just at this moment, it might be failing, and Paul is feeling like a failure. As he's arguing with them, he's also evaluating himself. And this letter gets more and more personal until we arrive at the spot that we're going to read today. This, in my opinion, is the most vulnerable that Paul ever gets. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It starts with Paul talking about boasting. He goes off on this little tangent about a man he knows who got caught up to the third heaven. Uh, We don't know what that is. Don't get hung up on it. Paul is just tossing it in as a random example of someone who deserves to be boasting. Do notice, however, how Paul stumbles and repeats himself. For me, I get this feeling that he's stalling. Uh, It's just these verbal ums and ahs because his mind is really on the next thing he's about to say. And he's anxious about saying it. He's about to open up about something that's really personal. Let's listen to that passage. He says, It is necessary to boast. Uh, nothing is to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in this body or uh, out of the body, I don't know, God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except for my weaknesses. But if I wished to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ, For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Whoa, that sounds juicy, eh? I want to know everything about this. And Paul leaves it tantalizingly vague. It's titillating, which makes you wonder if it's sexual. Maybe. Or maybe it's a mental health thing. Perhaps, or maybe it's an addictions issue, or an anger issue, or a faith issue, or an embarrassing health issue. It's got to be more than arthritis or a toothache. You get the sense from the letter that this is something more private, perhaps more shameful. There's spiritual connotations to it. Paul is tormented by it, and it's likely affecting his ministry and his personal well-being. And he doesn't feel comfortable talking about it directly. We'll never know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. And if this was any other person, I would say that we should be respectful and not speculate. But because this is Paul, let's really speculate. What if it was an addiction, let's say? Paul could very easily be living with an alcohol or gambling addiction. I want you to just think about that for a moment. How would that change your views on Paul? 
If you grew up in the church like me, you would have lived with the presence of Paul in your life. Uh, just Paul elicits this strong reaction. People either love him or hate him. Personally, I love him, but I understand why he gets characterized as harsh and judgmental and intense. But what if he was also alcoholic? Would that change how you feel about him? Suddenly, this saint seems a lot more human. Paul had experienced significant trauma. His life had been completely changed. He had lost all of his friends and social supports. He'd been imprisoned multiple times. He got kicked out of synagogues and cities. He has a driven personality with little time for rest. He believes Jesus is coming back any moment, so there's no time for relationships or family. And now the churches that he helped establish are struggling and will possibly fail. And he feels like a failure. There's a lot of reasons he might be tempted to self-medicate with alcohol. Maybe he rambles a bit in the passage we just read because he's a little drunk. He feels ashamed about it. He prays for God to take it away But that works for Paul as well as it works for anyone else struggling with addictions. Paul is weak and powerless in the face of this thorn. Again, we don't know what Paul was going through. It could have been an addiction. It could have been depression or anxiety or a particularly embarrassing case of hemorrhoids. Whatever it was, it bothered him deeply and it affected his sense of self-worth. He couldn't fight it, and he probably hated himself for it. And this is where Paul becomes really relatable. I don't know what you're going through, but we all have our own thorns, don't we? Maybe it's something you've never talked about. Maybe it's something you've received a official diagnosis for. Maybe you've sought treatment, or maybe treatment isn't an option. And as hard as you pray about it, it doesn't go away. You wonder if maybe you're not praying hard enough, or you're not strong enough, or you're not good enough. A better person wouldn't struggle like this. It must be something wrong with you as a person. Maybe I'm exposing myself too much, but I think these negative voices are a universal experience. We all have thorns like this. Things about ourselves that we pray were different. Problems that undermine our whole sense of self-worth, leaving us feeling weak and powerless. There's a bit of comfort to be had in knowing that Paul struggled with this too. So clearly, this isn't an issue of faith. Other than Abraham and Jesus, I can't think of anyone else who had more faith than Paul. And still, Paul struggled. So no, you're not praying wrong. If you have a faith of a mustard seed, you've got enough. That's not the issue. Keep praying, of course, but in your prayers, perhaps petition less and listen more. For three times, Paul prayed about his thorn, and on the third time he listened. He heard God say, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Paul was feeling weak and powerless. And God said, that's beautiful. That's right where I want you to be. When you feel strong and in control, you've got this false sense of self. Being in control is an illusion. It can be taken away with one phone call from your doctor or one global pandemic. If you are feeling weak and powerless, it's because, as a human being, you are. At least you've got now a better grasp of reality. They say geniuses tend to suffer more from depression because they see the world for what it is, which is just the sort of thing a depressed person would say. We are helpless. We can't pull ourselves up from our own bootstraps. We struggle with things that we will never overcome. We are tormented with thorns that will never go away. But as Paul says, that's nothing to be ashamed about. That's something to boast in. Those of us with thorns, 
we know better that it is by God's grace alone that we get through each day. If you put on pants, it's by God's grace alone. If you showered, it, wow, God's grace alone. You washed the dishes, you went for a walk, God's grace. When each step is a struggle, each step becomes something you rejoice about. You don't rejoice in the suffering itself. Suffering is always bad, let me be clear. But you rejoice that you got out of your chair today on your own or with help. Sobriety will always be a struggle, but each day you are sober is a day to praise God. I wish that prayer alone could cure you completely, but that's not how it works. Instead, we're given grace sufficient to get through the day. And that changes your perspective on everything. Instead of feeling horribly ashamed about his weakness, Paul says that his weakness is a moment when he sees the power of God. We see Paul as the greatest evangelist who did amazing things and started churches all around the ancient world. He's a saint in our eyes. But Paul would disagree. None of it was Paul's work. All of it was God's work. Paul did nothing. It was all God. Paul is a weak shell of a man, but with Christ in Paul, anything could be accomplished. So Paul boasts in his weakness because his weakness is power, the power of God. For those of you who hate yourselves for whatever reason, let me say, that reason you hate yourself, that thorn in your flesh, that is awful. There's nothing good about it. I know you've prayed that God would take it away, and I would join my prayers to yours. I wish for God to make you whole. But as we pray for that, let's also listen. Let's listen to where God is acting in your life right now. Let's watch for the signs of God's grace. Let's celebrate the little moments when God lifts you up, when God, through others, gives you a hug, when God, through the beauty of creation, smiles on you. The more you look for it, the more you're going to see God's grace all around you. The weaker you feel, the more you're going to experience God's strength. The thornier your issue the more you bear witness to God's power. May we boast all the more gladly in our weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in us. Amen. Lord God, we bring before you all of our thorny issues, all of those things about ourselves that that we despise about ourselves, things we wish we could change, whether that might be a physical thing, a mental thing, a spiritual thing, whatever it is, we pray today again that you might change that thing, that you might relieve us of this thorn. But at the same time, we pray that you will help us to see your grace all around us. May we see how your grace is sufficient for us. May we celebrate the little things uh, throughout our day, the little blessings, the health that we have, the energy that we have, the friends and family that we have. May we see in all those other ways your grace and power surrounding us. We pray for all of those who struggle with issues of addiction, for those who live with alcohol and uh, drug abuse, that you will bring them healing, that you will help them one day at a time to find sobriety, for those people who support them, that they will find the communities they need 
to uh, be um, to, 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 to get the strength they need to, to carry through. We pray for those living with mental illness, that you will bring them peace, that you will guide psycho- psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, and the fa- family members and all those who support them. We pray for uh, the COVID situation, for a quick distribution of vaccines all around the world, for a healthcare system that is still under stress, for nurses, doctors, and staff uh, who are perhaps reaching burnout right now. Give them the strength they need. We pray for catastrophes around the world, remembering especially right now uh, the building that collapsed in Florida, the forest fires in BC, the towns and homes that have been destroyed, for lives lost because of the heat wave. And pray for all of those who will be struggling with grief right now, that they will find comfort in you and through the people around them. We pray for the, the climate crisis our world faces that you will guide politicians and industry and uh, everyday voters to make decisions that will take care of this planet. We give thanks for the different ways you bless us, for summer employment, for those looking for jobs uh, and uh, those who have found work, for days when we might of have relief from the heat for family and friends that surround us. These things we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, I hopefully, sometime this summer, we might be able to reopen the church. Uh, if, just so those who might may not have got an email. Our church is not yet open. We're going to wait and watch, uh, see how things unfold over the next couple weeks, and then make a decision later about that. Uh, So keep praying that uh, people get uh, the vaccines and stay safe. But I hope to see you all uh, sometime soon, and I wish you God's blessing in the week ahead. Goodbye.